So again, this was also passed uh, by Congress on the 19th of uh, December and signed into law by the President on the 20th. It provides a comprehensive set of provisions that were designed to really expand opportunities for individuals to increase savings and to simplify the retirement system. And there are a lot of really positive items in this, uh, in this SECURE Act and a couple of complications. I'm going to talk about those provisions that address mostly individual taxpayers. There are a series of provisions that deal with the design of uh, pension and profit sharing plans to liberalize their, how they are structured, to whom they have to provide benefits for, and um, they, they're really items that uh, pension, pension firms are gonna be handling and dealing with and communicating with their clients. So I'm not gonna go into some of those details today, but I'm gonna talk about those items in this law that really focus on what happens to, to all of us who are saving and, and building funds and retirement plans and utilizing them later on, hopefully, uh, comfortably in retirement. The first item in here deals with um, uh, in, in a, a more narrow issue. Um, interestingly, under the old law, under the law as it was before this, if you were a graduate student or a postdoctoral student and you were getting a, a fellowship or a stipend from the university where you were studying and doing this, that, that income was not considered earned income under, under the tax law. You had to pay tax on it as though you earned it, but it wasn't, quote, earnings for purposes of your ability to make a, a contribution to an IRA or other retirement plan. So the law now is changing that. All of these SECURE Act provisions I'm talking about are effective in the year 2020 and forward. So none of these are retroactive, uh, save for one provision, which I'll talk about at the end. So starting this year, it, um, these types of students are getting these degrees in, 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 uh, in graduate and postdoctoral programs, can treat that income as earned income and will be able to make contributions to IRAs. Um, this is near and dear to me. My son's getting his uh, PhD down at the University of North Carolina, and he gets a stipend every year, and now um, if he so can afford, he can put money into an IRA. The, the interesting thing about this is, for any of you that know individuals going through this, these stipends are, are, and, and fellowships are, are really very small. And uh, for the most part, they're not even enough for them to live on uh, during the year, let alone put away a, a, an amount into the, for their future. But nonetheless, uh, for those that can afford to do so, this is an added benefit. So here's a, um, this, is, this is one of the uh, more significant changes in the new law. Under the old law, once you became, the, the, you reached the age of 70 and a half, and you are still working, and in, in America today, there are many, many uh, people who continue to work well past what used to be a normal retirement age. You are no longer permitted to make contributions into an IRA um, after that age. The new law beginning in 2020 repeals this pro prohibition and now allows contributions to be made into an IRA at any point in time as long as you're working and have earned income, just regardless of your age. Um, like anything, um, something that sounds so simple has a complication to it. And the complication is, um, several, uh, several years ago, actually, uh, qu quite a few number of years ago, a provision was passed that allows individuals who are over age 70 and a half who were starting to withdraw funds from their IRAs uh, it permitted them to direct those distributions directly to a charity in which, under which that provision would then not tax the IRA distribution. You wouldn't get a charitable contribution, but it would reduce your, your, uh, your income, which could be beneficial for people that don't itemize deductions, so that in effect they get a charitable deduction by virtue of using their IRA, and it also lowered their adjusted income, which under old law could have an impact on percentage limitations on the deductions of other items. That provision still applies. So you can still, once you're over age 70 and a half, give away directly from your IRA to a charity up to $100,000 a year. And many of our clients avail themselves of this. It's a, it's a, it's a, great, uh, it's a great opportunity if you're charitably inclined. The issue now is if you can continue to contribute into your IRA and get a tax deduction for that contribution, while at the same time you could then direct distributions that you're required to take because of your age to a charity, 
you'd be basically getting a deduction for an item that you're not paying tax on as you withdraw it. So they had to deal with this issue by changing in the law a provision that says, to the extent that you take money out of your IRA at, to go to charity under these charitable provisions, you have to reduce the amount that you're allowed to exclude from income by that charitable gift by the amount of contributions that you've made cumulatively into your IRA after you became 70 and a half. You got it? OK. Um, so I got an example. I, I know, um, so let, let's assume that uh, you have made, after age 70 and a half, contributions to, uh, to your IRA of, um, I can't see my own writing here, um, $28,000. And then in, after doing this for a number of years, as you're still working, you decide to um, have $78,000 of your IRA distribution in a future year directed to a charity directly so that you would not have to normally pay, report and pay tax on that $78,000. Under this new provision, you would report this, you would take the $78,000, but you would reduce that amount by the $28,000 of cumulative contributions you've made so that in effect you can only exclude $50,000 of that distribution that you took from your IRA from your income. So the other $28,000 you're going to report as income, and which makes sense because you got the tax benefit of taking a deduction for that over the last four years. So now you're going to pick it up in income uh, as part of the distribution you take from the IRA. So this is a, a little bit of a complication that we're going to have to deal with as we have clients who start making IRA contributions after age 70 and a half. You all got it? Great. Um, Scott, what, but when you take that IRA money out, you're still going to have to pay tax on it. Well, which, which, which one? In, my exam, in the example, which, which, which number are you talking about? The, the $28,000 of contributions you made to your IRA, if you then begin to take distributions of that, you're going to have to pay tax on well, it. That, that's, true, that's true always. So, so whenever, whenever you make a contribution to your IRA, which is a tax-deductible contribution, in the future, when you take money out of your IRA, it's taxable. Yes, but it's still double tax. That's yeah. right. There's tax in it. Well, no, but you got a deduction for that $28,000 in those first four years by putting, by putting it in. Yeah, but, but you're not getting, but you're, they're, they're reducing your QCD, so you're having to pay tax on that. So, so normally, without the QCD rules, right. if you took $78,000 out of your IRA, you would have paid tax on it. And if you, but if you gave $78,000 directly to the charity, you would, have had, you would not have had to report the $78,000 in your income, and nor would you have gotten the $78,000 charitable contribution. So it just would have been like an ignored item. Now when you take that $78,000 and direct it to the charity, it's treated as though you took $28,000 of that and pay tax on it, but you will get a $28,000 charitable contribution deduction for the $28,000 because you did contribute it to charity. So it's, a, it's, a, it's changing it. So, so depending on the amount and whether you itemize or not, it will or will not have a tax benefit. Oh, so you're saying that that 28 becomes income and... Uh, and the charitable, yes. The 28 becomes income and a, and, a char and a potential charitable deduction if you are itemizing deductions. But the odd thing here is that when you were 69 and you contributed, you can pull that money out the next year as part of a QCD, and, there's, and you're in a much better position in a sense. Correct. So they draw the line in the sand at age... 70 and a half. And a half for no particular reason. That's exactly what they did. By exp well... There is a reason, and the reason always comes down to money. So what, what, is the cost of, of a, what is the cost of a benefit compared, and how do we pay for that cost? Because Congress, when they pass legislation with tax, with tax benefits and costs to the government, they have to have offsetting revenue to offset that. So this is, yes, Darren, is exactly what they did. They drew a line in the sand and said that these, this benefit of being able to contribute post 70 and a half to your IRA has a cost if you're going to use those dollars to uh, under the qualified charitable distribution provisions. Is this traditional IRAs only or SEP IRAs included? It's, um, I believe it's traditional IRAs because that's all you can use for the uh, qualified charitable distribution rules. You can, you can use the SEP, you can use SEPs, and then it would, it would include for the SEP as well, if it does. So my apology. Any, any, anything that you could use to, use to qualify charitable distribution for would, would, would apply to this. And there's no workaround. 
as far as having multiple accounts? No, no, because the IRAs are all accumulated when for determining what your distributions are and, and put together that way. This is, this is one of the items that's not exactly an individual related. It deals more with the pension plan design, but it's, uh, I think it's um, interest, interesting that, that you should be aware of. Um, Congress was concerned that companies were hiring and employing people on a part-time basis, and as a result of that, they were able to exclude them from participation in their pension and 401k plans. So the new law adds a provision that allows long-term part-time workers to actually participate in 401k plans and make elective deferrals. The company doesn't have to match or give money in if they're not meeting their normal th income thresholds or time thresholds for these employees. But the, the individual now has the opportunity to defer income on an elective basis um, if they meet these, uh, these thresholds, which are, I believe, a uh, minimum of 500 hours of work over a three-year period. Um, they have to have been employed for at least three consecutive years and have to have attained the age of 21 uh, by the end of that time. And that way that they will then have the opportunity to elect to defer money into a 401k plan where they otherwise would not have been able to participate. Is it, is it you're not allowed to participate if you're under a certain number of hours? Most, most company plans don't per, permit participation unless you have 1,000 hours of service. I think they can, a company could, could expand it, but they normally don't because of matching and the desire to minimize their you know, their overall costs with respect to how they function with their employment costs. The, the, uh, the new law allows um, the ability to expand uh, distributions from IRAs and, and pension plans before your age 59, and a, 59, which is and a half, which is the time you can start taking money out of an IRA without penalty. Um, so now, now for individuals who want to take a distribution of uh, of, of up to $5,000 per person, so a husband and wife can each take the same amount, they could withdraw funds for adoptions and or births if they withdraw that money within a year of the uh, date of the birth or adoption. Um, the money that you're pulling out is still taxable, so uh, it's not something that you would necessarily re recommend they do, but if they do need the funds and they need to tap into these funds, they can do so without penalty. Again, starting in 2020. Um, no, another of the uh, more uh, significant uh, changes is under our current law, um, you are required to start withdrawing funds from your IRA on the, uh, the, the April 1st of the year following the year that you turn age 70 and a half. So everyone talks about 70 and a half as the, as the point in time. So the year you turn 70 and a half, starting that following April, you have to start taking out minimum distributions from your IRA. Uh, beginning in 2020, that age now has been changed from 70 and a half to 72. So it, what it does is it allows another uh, year and a half of, um, of, of tax-free accumulation of funds in the IRAs before any withdrawals are required. So going back to uh, the, the law, now if you're age 70 and a half, 71, and you're working, you can put money into an IRA, and you're not required to take money out until you hit age 72. And then you can contribute to contribute, but you'll still be required to start taking out minimum distributions at that point in time. Excuse me. Is that also applicable to 401ks? I believe it is, that it, it applies to all pension, I, I think it applies across the board to all pension plans, not just to, IR, not just to IRAs, but it includes 401ks. Um, many, many people, when they start retiring, roll their 401ks into IRAs, and, and, that, and these will kick in. But yes, it still applies to that. The, 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 law also, um, the, the law also provides, which I didn't get into, that if you're still working and you're not a 5% owner of a company, the time frame within which you have to do, um, do, do things with your pension plans can be deferred. But if it's in, money's in an IRA, that's a fixed date. When you're 72 or 70 and a half under the current law, you have to start taking out the minimum distribution. Under, the, uh, under old law, for companies that wanted to create pension plans, and these are not um, SEP IRAs or normal IRAs, but, um, or, or, but profit sharing plans and the like, companies would have had to have created and formed the plan by the end of the year, assuming a company's on a calendar year end. By December 31st, they would have had to create the plan in order for them to be able to fund it for themselves and their employees uh, for that tax year subsequent to the close of the year. So it, it was always a rush for companies that were looking to implement plans 
that they had to actually have them created. They didn't have to fund them, but they had to have them created in order to allow them to make contributions into that plan and relate it back to the tax year that they created the plan. The, the new law liberalizes this and now allows the companies to actually adopt or create the plan by the due date of the tax return for which they want to make that contribution. So if you have a December year end, you have until the following year the extended due date of the tax return, depending on the type of entity you are, to actually create and form the plan, contribute money, and have it relate back as though it were a contribution in the prior tax year. So this, this is, a, this is a, a welcome liberalization of the rules. I'm going to assume, just in two sentences, 529 plans are savings vehicles in which you, a parent, a grandparent, can contribute money into a state-sponsored uh, fund. The money then can be... Um, <coughs> invested, grow tax-free, and if it's withdrawn at a future date to pay for educational expenses to a child, a grandchild, or, or, or somebody else, that withdrawal comes out tax-free, so you get the accumulation of these funds tax-free. Uh, the only adverse impact to deal with on these is that contributions into those plans uh, constitute a gift for gift tax purposes. So you have to look at whether there's any kind of gift tax impact. And in many states, including Pennsylvania, there's actually a tax benefit. You get a deduction for that contribution into that 529 plan. So it's a, it's a pretty robust savings vehicle to use for uh, savings for, for college tuition. Um, the, the new act expands a bit how 529 plans can be used. Uh, the old law was, and I'm just uh, getting to make sure I have all this together, that you could qual you qual the expenses qualified to be withdrawn tax-free if they were used for tuition, equipment. Room and board also qualified as long as the student was at least uh, more than a half-time or part-time student at, at that university. Um, under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act law that was passed a couple of years ago, um, they expanded the 529 plans to allow you to withdraw money up to $10,000 a year to actually fund tuition at elementary or uh, and private uh, secondary schools. So it, uh, it brought it down from the college and post-college uh, post level down to even uh, sc schools for, for kids. Um, and there was always a provision in the law that said that student loan interest for individuals who are making below certain income thresholds could be deducted as a deduction even if you couldn't itemize deductions. So those were the, 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 the provisions that applied prior to this, these modifications. The new law expands, again, starting in 2020, ways in which you can utilize the 529 plans on a, on a tax-free basis. One of them is if you have what are called qualified apprenticeships, which are defined in the law and are monies that are being withdrawn where you're going to be involved in an apprenticeship that's, a, that's qualified. It's going to be a formalized program that's met certain tests and standards, so money can be pulled out to use for that since many apprenticeships and internships are, uh, are not paying anymore. You pay to participate, so you can use some of these funds for that. Stu you, you can withdraw up to $10,000 uh, to cover the uh, cost of student loan debt, which includes principal and interest. And in addition to withdrawing the money for the student who, for whose benefit the 529 plan was established, they're also allowed to withdraw that to for the same reason to benefit a sibling of that student if they have student debt. So again, this is an expansion. Um, the offset for this is if you have pull money out of the 529 plan tax-free to pay for your student debt, and some of that money you, you pulled out was to pay for interest on that debt, you can't then still deduct that interest uh, on your tax return. So that's why I mentioned the student interest issue. Now, now we're gonna talk about the negative. They had to pay for all of this. And, um, and, and the way that this was paid for in large part was through a provision I'm going to talk about in a, in a moment which deals with the IRA um, be beneficiaries who inherit IRAs. Uh, the other way they did this was they increased penalties um, for a failure to file retirement plan tax returns. Uh, retirement plans are required to file returns annually, uh, forms 5500 you may have heard of, and, and many uh, the penalties have been severely increased and expanded to, uh, to penalize companies that are not doing this. Um, hopefully that won't be an issue for any of us, uh, but it's, um, it's, it's a revenue raiser that's anticipated to offset, in part, some of the cost of all these pension plan reforms and IRA changes. But the real big change deals with um, what happens 
when you are a beneficiary and inherit monies from somebody who has passed away with IRA funds and has named you as a beneficiary. This is a very complicated area um, and, and will continue to be a complicated area. But generally, under the old law, if, um, if an IRA owner, and I'm using IRAs um, here because it's the easiest to describe, but to, to answer the question that's come up a couple of times, this also applies to employees and in, in, in plans as well, not just IRAs. If, if, you, if an IRA uh, owner died on or after the date in which they were, start, they were required to begin taking distributions, so as I said, in an IRA, that, that was 70 and a half, the April 1st after 70 and a half, and now under the new law, it would be 72. Under the old law, what would happen is the beneficiary, because the IRA owner was already starting to take their distributions, was required to take the remaining interest dis distributed to them out of the IRA to pay tax on, uh, at least as rapidly as under the method that was being used before the death of the, uh, of the individual who was in the IRA, but was the IRA owner. If an IRA owner had died before that required date, so they were under age 70 and a half, the distributions were generally required to begin within one year after the date of death, and the beneficiary was permitted to withdraw these funds over their life expectancy, based on life expectancy tables. So think of the power of that. If, uh, if grandfather has a million dollar IRA, and passes away and leaves that IRA to his or her 10-year-old grandchild, that grandchild would then be able to require, be required to withdraw those funds over that grandchild's life expectancy, which would, as you can imagine, for a 10-year-old, would be a very long period of time. This is called the stretch IRA. That's the words you're going to hear a lot. So the ability to take these retirement plans and stretch the time over which they had to be withdrawn, allowing continued tax-free growth in these IRAs was a very powerful tool that many clients of ours and many, um, many individuals use as a planning tool to, uh, to deal with the best way to pass on their wealth to next generations. Um, the law always had exceptions for spouses. If you left your IRA to your, to your wife or your husband, um, they had the ability to take that and move it into their own IRA and then avail themselves of these rules uh, based on their age and when they started to need to take it out. Um, the, the new law doesn't change how spouses are dealt with it. You continue to have the ability to, to move funds uh, intraspousal without, without a, a problem. If you didn't name in your, under the old law, if you didn't name a designated beneficiary, which was defined as an individual or a trust that was designed in a way to, in effect, treat an individual as the owner of that trust, then you were required in the old law to withdraw the IRA funds or the pension funds uh, once upon the death of the, uh, the IRA holder within five years. So if you left your IRA to your estate, instead of naming your spouse or your children or grandchildren, but you left it to your estate, you had a five-year period within which you had to withdraw all those funds. There was no stretch. So with that, the new law has upended these rules. This, again, is effective for uh, distributions with respect to IRA owners who die after December 31, 2019. So it's effective for 2020 going forward. The general rule now under this new provision is that the remaining account balance upon the death of the, uh, the IRA holder whether they had started to take their minimum distribution and because they were over a certain age or whether they had not, these funds have to be distributed to the designated beneficiary within 10 years after the death. So you can see that power of stretching the IRA or stretching the, uh, these benefits has now been truncated to a set period of time, 10 years. And again, as I said, this applies whether the IRA owner had died before, on, or after the required beginning date. Um, the 10-year rule does not require that you take the money out uniformly over that 10 years. It just requires that by the end of the 10th calendar year following the date of death, you have to withdraw all the funds. So in effect, you could allow the IRA to accumulate during uh, the next 10-year period. And then at that point in time, you would have to distribute 100% of the uh, funds. I'm not suggesting this, by the way, necessarily. It may, it may be a planning option to consider depending on the magnitude and size. But keep in mind, as these IRA funds are distributed to the beneficiaries, they're taxable income. 
So if you have a sizable IRA now, in the old law, if you're stretching out a million dollars over 50 or 60 years on the, based on the life expectancy of a 10-year-old, that income is coming in in small increments and, and not necessarily increasing the tax brackets in which that income is going to be taxed. Now when you're compressing this into a 10-year period, you're going to be significantly increasing the amount of income being reported on, the, on that, that beneficiary's tax return and likely pushing this income into higher tax brackets. Um, the reason that if you, why I said waiting for 10 years is not necessarily a great idea is think about that in a sizable IRA, you would be then bringing all this income into, in, to be reported in one year, in which case a substantial portion of that could be taxed at the highest tax rates. So you may not have availed yourself of the benefits of, of using the tax brackets that you do have available over, <coughs> over that 10 year period. Um, everyone got how this is working? Yes. So if you have inherited IRAs, they've been recognized over the last 15 years. This does not impact it's only the people that are inheriting after. Yes, yes. The, the, existing, exist, the existing rules still continue to apply to beneficiaries who have inherited IRAs pre-2020 uh, pre deaths. Um, there are several exceptions to the 10-year rule. The 10-year the rule does not apply, um, again, to a surviving spouse if you named your spouse as a beneficiary. So that's a... Uh, that's a good thing. If your child, if you name a child, not a grandchild, if you name your child as a beneficiary and your child has not yet reached the age of majority, so that will depend on state by state, that child is permitted to withdraw the money from the IRA based on their life expectancy, just as under the old law, until they reach the age of majority. And then, at that point, the 10-year rule kicks in and they have to take the money out within 10 years. So it gives a little bit of a longer stretch or spread for children under the age of majority. Uh, chronically ill individuals can, can take the money out over a much longer time. They don't have this 10-year acceleration. And um, if the other individual you name as your beneficiary is not more than 10 years younger than you, then that person can just step into this, the, the, um, the inherited uh, funds, and take it out over the, their life expectancy. So. Um, it's, uh, you know, if you're, uh, if you're not married, you name a, a, but you're cohabitating with somebody, and you name them as a beneficiary, and they're the same age, they can then, they can then stretch it out over their life expectancy as under the old law.